My name is Nina Cortell. It's my very great pride and pleasure to be the president of the Center for Women in Law and to welcome all of you. Today, we begin an important new tradition. The Center for Women in Law is today presenting its inaugural Hortense Ward Courageous Leader Award. The award bears the name of Hortense Ward because she was a true Texas trailblazer. When you hear her name, I want you to think of someone who combines the qualities of Barbara Jordan, Ann Richards with a dash of Annie Oakley. <laughs> Ward did all that they did, but she did it a century earlier. But you don't have to rely on me to tell you Hortense Ward's story because we are the lucky beneficiary of a very short video that will tell you all about Hortense Ward. So now to the video. If you've never heard of Hortense Sparks Ward, you're not alone. Women of her day rarely received the attention or credit they deserved. She was born in 1872 in Matagorda County. Her parents, Frederick and Louise Sparks, moved to Edna, where Hortense spent the remainder of her childhood until going off to Nazareth Academy, a Catholic convent school in Victoria, Texas. She returned to Edna in 1890 and worked as a school teacher. In 1891, she married Albert Malch, with whom she had three daughters. In 1903, she took a job in Houston as a court reporter and stenographer, and shortly thereafter determined to pursue studies in law school. She and Malsh were divorced in 1906, yet Hortons continued her pursuit of a law degree. In 1908, she married Houston attorney William Henry Ward, who later became a county judge. In 1910, Hortons passed the Texas Bar Exam, becoming the first female lawyer to gain admission into the Texas Bar Association. That same year, she and her husband opened their practice. Thus, a decade before federal law would grant women in America the right to vote or serve on juries, Hortense Sparks Ward was practicing civil law. Of course, to avoid triggering the prejudices of the all-male jury pools, Hortense did not appear in court. She nonetheless proved an astute partner for the firm, and she would come out from behind the scenes soon enough. Hortense used her sharp legal mind to become a powerful champion of women's rights in America. As the 20th century took hold, Hortense began writing newspaper articles opposing the KKK and lobbying for women's suffrage, labor reform, and prohibition. She wrote pamphlets instructing women on voting requirements and procedures. She spearheaded the Married Women's Property Rights Law, nicknamed the Hortense Ward Act that allowed married women in Texas to control their own property and earnings. In addition, as vice president of the Houston Equal Suffrage Association, she fought for industry changes that would permit a woman to serve as corporate officers and to vote in state and federal primaries. In fact, in June of 1918, she became the first female registered voter in Harris County. As a passionate prohibitionist, Ward co-authored the state constitutional amendment in 1919. She fought aggressively for laws to protect women in industry. In 1925, she was appointed Chief Justice of the first ever All-Women State Supreme Court, ruling over lien cases from which the male judges had been required to recuse themselves. Hortense Sparks Ward. Now, amazingly, we have here today the great-granddaughters of Hortense Ward, and that includes Linda Hunsaker, who's a founder of the center, and her sisters, if they would stand. <clears throat> to the gen due to the generosity of their family, we are so lucky that Hortense Ward is an in-memoriam founder of the Center for Women in Law. So we have good roots. The award that we are presenting today in Hortense Ward's name recognizes an outstanding woman lawyer who exemplifies Ward's tenacity, courage, and commitment to gender parity in positions of leadership, influence, and responsibility, both in the legal profession and beyond. 
But the key quality we want to emphasize, and hopefully will inspire all of us today, is the quality of courage. The courage to publicly use your voice, even when it is not popular to do so. The courage to affect meaningful change. The courage to stand up and make a difference in the lives of women everywhere. And for those of you that know her, and those of you who will now know her, our honoree, Mary Cranston, exemplifies all of these qualities in a most spectacular way. Throughout her career, Mary has used her voice and her boundless energy to further the position of women in the legal profession as well as the corporate world. As the first woman to lead a global 100 law firm, Pillsbury, Winthrop, Shaw, and Pittman, Mary created and championed numerous diversity programs and policies that were aimed at increasing the number of women in leadership positions. Here are just a few examples. She advocated for the adoption of a part-time policy, which was the first of its type in California. She persuaded the firm to put more women into leadership positions. She formulated the first maternity leave policy, and she moved Pillsbury into the top 10 rankings among American firms for women and minorities. But Mary's achievements are not limited to her law firm. Far from it. In the American Bar Association, Mary made a conscious decision to become active in the antitrust section. And why, and I ho hope this doesn't offend anyone here, but there were a bunch of white guys in that group. And uh, she saw that as an opportunity to take leadership and to help other women become more active in that section. So she took on the Leadership and Gender Task Force, which made recommendations and accomplished that very goal. Similarly, as a member of the San Francisco Bay Area Glass Ceiling Task Force, Mary motivated firms and corporate law departments to increase their representation of women and minorities in leadership positions. And more recently, as chair of the ABA Commission on Women, Mary oversaw the, color, the Women of Color Research Initiative, which focused specifically on issues that are, pertain to women of color in the legal profession, particularly those relating to advancement and retention. But Mary's achievements are not confined to the legal profession. She sits on no fewer than five public company boards, and on three of those boards, she has become the chair of the nominating committee, where she can ensure that diverse slates are considered for director positions as well as for C-suite succession planning. All of her boards have added at least one or two women during her tenure. And for any of you who know what it's like in the corporate boardroom, that is a remarkable achievement. But Mary's achievements are not limited to the boardroom. Throughout her career, she has been a tireless public voice for women. She has written and spoken extensively on the issues that confront and act as barriers to women in the legal and corporate worlds. She has been an outspoken advocate on our behalf for change. One example is a recent article she wrote titled Assumptions and Prejudices. In that article, she dispels the myths that prevent women from achieving their rightful place in the corporate boardroom. She writes, and I quote, we need to recognize that three women on a board is not success. She also writes, women lawyers can be some of the strongest and most experienced board members and we need to increase the number of women directors because it is good for the bottom line, it is fair, and it is right. In short, Mary Cranston is a modern day Hortense Ward. Like Hortense, I want you to think about the qualities of Barbara Jordan, Ann Richards, and yes, a dash of Annie Oakley. Because of Mary, women lawyers are better positioned to be leaders, and we are all better positioned to achieve parity in our chosen endeavors, whether that be in the law firm context, in the corporate world, in academia, in government, nonprofit, wherever it is we want to go, we have a better chance of achieving our goals. It is for her unparalleled tenacity and leadership, for being a wonderful person and truly an inspiration to us all, that the Center for Women in Law, 
is so proud to present the Hortense Ward Courageous Leader Award to Mary Cranston, and I hope she'll please come up and please congratulate her with your applause. Before I turn it over to Mary, I want to just say a word about our, our wonderful award we're giving. I, for those of you that can see it, it, it's of considerable size and weight, so I won't try to pick it up. <laughs> we are thankful to Linda Brooks for helping us acquire this award, and I want to explain it to you because it's filled with symbolism. It's a sculpture, actually, and the title of the sculpture is Believe, because you have to believe and you have to imagine to make things happen. Because if you don't believe in it, it won't happen. The figure leans forward as if reaching for the impossible. It moves in a circular motion because it's a tireless effort for us all to achieve success. There are empty space in the middle because it requires, our journey requires that we be open to new ideas. So this hopefully will remind Mary and all of us of all of the parts that it takes to be a courageous leader. And again, congratulations, Mary. Well, this is um, truly overwhelming. Thank you all so much. And um, I'm actually very humbled by all of this, especially in this room. In fact, really all I can do is smile and do a little happy dance up here because <laughs> Some of those who are very near and dear to me, uh, so many that are near and dear to me, are here today. And uh, I can't name all of you in five minutes, but I, I want to call out a few. Uh, my longest serving significant other, my twin sister, Susan Bailey Harnden. <laughs> She's a pioneer in her own field. She was the first woman vascular surgeon in the United States. And. <clears throat> And she is accompanied today by my very treasured brother-in-law, David Harnden. Um, David. <laughs> my adorable son, John Cranston, need I say more. <laughs> and my Texas son of the heart, Charlie Dean. Also, um, yeah, go ahead, Charlie. He's from Texas, you know, we should. My deeply beloved husband, Roger, um, who has not been a significant other as long as Susan, but I think a lot of you know the backstory, and you know that Susan actually picked him for me. So <laughs> he came certified. And then, <laughs> there he is. and then Catalyst, the very appropriately named organization that has pioneered much of the research and best practices that have transformed the business world for women over the last 50 years. Catalyst nominated me for this award, and um, that was to me a very profound honor. And my dear friend and just retired CEO of Catalyst, Eileen Lang and her husband Neil, are here today. Eileen's 10 years at Catalyst were geometrically transformative, and she has earned every bit of her legendary status. I will applaud. <laughs> And then all of my boards, um, GrabTech, my first company, uh, public company board, has brought all of the talented senior women of the company along with their brilliant CEO, Joel Hawthorne. Could you guys stand up? And California State Automobile Insurance, represented here by our wise and effective board chair, Ed Grubb, over there. My other boards, International Rectifier, Visa, and others have made contributions for this event, for which I'm grateful. My law firm of 40 years, Pillsbury, with some of our outstanding women lawyers, headed by my wonderful partner, Deb thorne Peden, are here. Thank you guys for coming. And I want to thank the Hunsaker family for coming to this amazing event in honor of your, uh, you know, what can you say, just uh, breakthrough uh, 
relative. It's just amazing, Hortense Ward. And for Ariana Huffington for being here to give it. I've admired Ariana for so many years, and it's just a total honor to have you here today. And then all of my beloved fellow travelers from the ABA Commission on Women and the Profession, from Direct Women, who are here today. And then finally, but not least, the University, Texas, uh, the University of Texas Center for Women in the Law, which in five, five short years has uh, put itself on the map as a, a national treasure of innovation and transformation for women in leadership. That's an amazing, amazing track record. And I really want to thank you so much for everything that you have done, uh, not the least of which is to establish an award like this, which will uh, provide the opportunity for many, many role models in the future to be honored. And actually, I shouldn't be too surprised at the impact of the women of Texas, because I have one other very special reason for being thrilled to be the first recipi recipient of the Ward Award. We may have to do something about the nickname of this thing. <laughs> from the University of Texas. My mother is a daughter of Texas. She was born on August 31st, 1922 in Dallas, Texas. And she was always very proud of her home state. And I always thought that being born in Dallas in August to be for air conditioning <laughs> is one of the reasons she was so tough and resilient. <laughs> a mother like my mother was a true blessing in life. And I'm sure she's bouncing in her chair up in heaven looking down on today. You know, I have to be truthful. When I got the call that I had been chosen for the award, I was truly honored. But I was also, and it was a surprise to me, a little troubled. And as I talked to my husband about it, I realized that my unease came from being, quote, the one who got the award. Now, I know the nominating committee was looking at many of you in this room and many who are not even here today who have been at my side during all the years that we've been pushing for equality for women. I know better than almost anybody what you have done. And I'm not saying I didn't do my part. I did. But the older I get, the more I see that what my generation did for women lawyers was part of a miraculous flowering of opportunity at the same time that some truly extraordinary women stepped up to the plate. We literally needed the contribution of every single one of us to have the impact that each of us had. We couldn't have done it without the sisterhood. So I finally figured out what was bugging me, and I also saw how I could accept this award with pure joy and an open heart. So I accept it gladly on behalf of myself and every single one of you who, with me, made the world where I could do my part. Thank you all so much for that. My aha moment about the award also clarified a few things I wanted to say to all of you today. Um, many of you have heard me talk over the years about the power of clear vision, about finding what is meaningful to you authentically, facing your fears and doing it anyway, speaking up, taking risk. And these are all really important tools in the kit of leadership. But today, I want to talk a little bit about why it matters so much that we all walk this walk now. As I said earlier, in my lifetime, last 50 years, I've seen the flowering of great woman leaders creating a global network for women. And that flowering happened simultaneously across the globe. It happened because each in her own way, every one of the pioneer women leaders had the courage to ignore millennia of conditioning in their own heads about how women should behave in a patriarchal world. And these rules of behavior are buried deep in our cultural unconscious, and both men and women carry the same stereotypes. Women experience them, of course, as fears and, and vague feelings of inadequacy for leadership. Men tend, and I say this sincerely, without malice, to underestimate what women can and what women want to do. Somehow and in some way in the last 50 years, enough women were able to find within themselves the courage and willingness to push through their own fears to be all that they can be and to face down external messages to the contrary. The awakening of each woman is an individual journey, but the impact is collective. As more and more women found authentic power and passion within themselves, as they ignored the good girl voice in their heads, as they said no to requests from people of power to do things that were not in their passion, as they took risk to be able to contribute more, a new cultural norm was being built in everybody. 
I'll go even further. I think the combined release of energy as women threw off the shackles of tradition created a mutual force of positive energy that is, avail uh, that is available for every woman, and men, frankly, to tap into. A greater sense of belonging, a greater trust in the worlds of business and government. The emerging old girls network is, to my mind, an external manifestation of this force. So is the now extensive and irrefutable research that shows that adding even a few women to the corporate boardroom or at the top of the house of corporate America has a highly, very highly correlated uh, correlation with improved operational and bottom line results. I believe that this force for women is growing exponentially, not linearly, and that we are literally at the tipping point where women will take their fair place in the worlds of law, business, and politics. None of us can hold back now. We need to bring our deepest selves to the service of the world. I want to end by acknowledging the important role that good and fair-minded men have played in opening opportunity for women. You've been the best kind of brothers to your sisters, and your example to other men has been a really powerful part of this whole journey, so thank you for that. And let me just end by thanking you again for this amazing honor. Thank you all for being on this planet with me at this time. I couldn't ask for more. Thanks a lot. <laughs>